this week I'd like to review the Apostolic Bible Polyglot. This is a volume that was recommended to me by a viewer. It is a Greek-English interlinear, and as you can see it includes both the Old and the New Covenants. It's from Apostolic Press, and it's a quite wide volume. It's about the same width as a uh, Cambridge Wide Margin Bible. This is the NKJV from Cambridge in hardback and height is very similar as is width. The ABP Apostolic Bible Polyglot is a bit thicker. In fact, dimension wise, it's nine and a half inches tall, seven and three quarters inches wide, and one and eleven sixteenths inches thick. The uh, text is formatted in two columns, as you see. Each column is about 77.5 millimeters wide, and it includes both Greek text, an English translation that's an interlinear, and a modified Strong's number system that tags to the Greek words. Page dimensions are 234 millimeters tall, 187 millimeters wide, so that's about 9.2 inches by 7.4 inches. The Greek text is very bold. The English is not so bold. It's a much, uh, much thinner typed font there for the English. The text is not line matched, and I'll see if I can show you that. Let's see. Right, so here's a page where quite clearly it isn't line matched, so I'll zoom in on that. I'll let you see that kind of a wide floppy page, but for instance here, this looks like the English here in between the lines from the opposite page. There's a line of English coming in here between the Greek and the Strong's on our side. The, let me zoom back out, I'm at the other out. The uh, margins at the top of the page are 16 to 19 millimeters. Uh, at the bottom, on a page like this, our bottom margin is 10 to 13 millimeters. The uh, inner margin is very narrow, can be as much as 8 millimeters. The outer dances between 13 and 15. The font in the text. When I compare the Greek font here to symbol font, it's about seven points. I compare the English to Times New Roman, it's about 7.5. There are verse numbers within the paragraphs, and in fact they give you not only the verse, but also the chapter as well. So we're, this, is, this is Obadiah chapter 9, verse 15. Then we get down to, oh I'm sorry that wasn't Obadiah, that's Amos, go down here to Obadiah, and we're in chapter 1, verse 3. Uh, added words, the, the words the translator adds are in italic font, so he's added the word there before the Lord, because there's no article in the Greek. So he puts uh, the article in English in italics. Old Testament quotations in the New Testament are not in a spirit special font or format. So if we look here in uh, Romans, where they're quite common, you don't see any special markings for them. Um, they are noted at the bottom of the page, and we will talk about these annotations in just a second. In the ABP, um, pronouns for deity are not capitalized, so here this him refers to Jesus, this he refers to Jesus, neither one is capitalized. Words of Christ are in black ink. Um, here I think we're in the middle of a quotation, let's see. Um, so here it is written, he found the place where it is written, and let's see, having rolled up the scroll, they gazed at him, he began to say to them that today the scripture is in your ears etc. So those are words of Christ. They're definitely in black ink. There are page bottom notes, as you see here. These give uh, references for quotations, and then you occasionally see a note like this. 
this one is or adversary. One of the good things about the notes is that you can read from the notes back up to the text. So if we look back up at 4.8, look up here behind me, Satan, he's saying that this word satana could also be translated as adversary. These notes are about 7.5 points in height, and as we said, they're tagged to the chapter and verse number. The paper sheet thickness is about 34.6 micrometers. I estimate the paper weight at about 32 GSM. There is sheen. You can see it there. It's not particularly bad. Uh, the paper is white with just slight yellowish tinge, and there is moderate show through. Because the Greek is so bold, the show through is not that bad of a problem for the Greek. For the English, it's a bit more so, but not a serious issue. These page are very, pages are very wide and floppy, so they're somewhat hard to turn. You cannot flip through this book to find your place. There is occasional print non-uniformity. I'll show you a typical example of that by going to pages 111 and 113. So here's 111. See how that's printed. And 113 beside it. So clearly 113 is much bolder than 111. Uh, still the light pages, like the one on the left, are still perfectly readable. There are no intros to books. So we'll just go back here to the beginning of Exodus. It's the end of Genesis. Alright, so here's Exodus. No introduction to it at all, it just launches. Book titles are in the center. And if this were a book that you could flip through, I would say that's a mistake. It should be over here. But since you really can't, you have to open the volume to turn a page. It really doesn't matter much here. Page numbers are on the outside. I would have preferred that to be on the inside in the chapter and verse number here, which gives you the page contents, um, is on the inner margin. So the first verse on um, the left, the right-hand page is chapter 50, verse 11. So the first full verse to begin there is there. On the left-hand page, 49.25 is what's written here, and 49.25 is the first full verse. So this works on a beginning verse system, not a beginning verse on the left and an ending verse on the right, which is much more common these days. We talked about book titles and contents, page numbers, our headings in the text occasionally. Here is one, Moses flees to Midian. They are in a 9.5 point bold italic font. Uh, quotations from the Old Testament we mentioned are in no special format. I believe we said that already. If you go to the New Testament and you find a quotation, it, uh, it's uh, not marked in any special way, except you do have the daggers at the bottom of the page indicating that it's quoted from something. Uh, there is no bold uh, two-line chapter number. This is common in modern Bibles. Instead, chapters are divided by the word chapter and the number of the chapter. The chapter word is in all caps. Uh, books of the Bible do not begin on a separate page. In fact, they don't even begin on a new column. They just begin where the old book ended. I think we saw that with Genesis. Same thing happens here at 1 Timothy. Thessalonians, 2 Thessalonians ends, 1 Timothy begins. At the end of the book of the Apocalypse, we come to an English-Greek index of the ABP. This is the editor's name. And uh, this index is 88 pages long. It's in a four-column format. It's in a Bible font. And it, what it does is it allows you to find the Greek word that corresponds to a particular English word. So if I wanted to know what the Greek word corresponding to agony was, I would look here and it would give it to me. After the Greek English English Greek index, we have a lexical concordance. So this is something of a dictionary and a concordance combined. It is 364 pages long. 
It includes Strong's numbers, or these Greek words, or the modified Strong's numbers, I should say. It's in a seven column format. And again, we're in the Bible font. So um, here's the Greek word for good. It gives you a Strong's number for it, a short definition, and then it lists all the places that you can find that word. I'm not sure whether it's comprehensive. I haven't uh, checked to see. But this is a lengthy and useful tool at the end of the book, the lexical concordance. There's also an analytical concordance not included in the volume, but um, which one I think can order access at the uh, Books website. After the lexical concordance, we have uh, 11 blank sheets, 22 blank pages, which you could use for notes. I would recommend putting a piece of lined notebook paper or graph paper beneath the page. Then you have one, two heavier pages, and you come to the back. This is a uh, book with no maps in the back. Uh, it does have black and white head and tail bands. You can see the glue line there. This is quite clearly a glued hardback. There uh, is no evidence of signatures. I believe an earlier edition of this book was sewn, but this one was quite clearly glued. It does lie open and fairly flat in Genesis. This is Exodus here, but you see you really have no problems getting the book to open fairly flat. Genesis chapter 2, chapter 1, so it's definitely open. If we come to the middle of the book, you see some rather sharp fall down into the center of the page, so you're going to have to adjust the book to make it flat if you have trouble reading on a slope as I do. Um, at the beginning of the book, I think we mentioned that there are no maps. Uh, no header, uh, no uh, no ribbon markers uh, included. Since there is no table of contents in the book itself, there is a laminated card with uh, and coral with table of contents. So as you see, we have the Hebrew Bible books in the normal order that you would say find in say a King James version Bible. So the uh, Deuterocanonical books are not included in this which uh, is something of a shame because this is a Septuagint um, with English translation interlinear in the Old Testament and many manuscripts of the Septuagint do include other books than these in the New Testament and then the Greek and English index and lexical concordance that we've already seen. The numbering is separate for each of these. Old Testament starts and ends, a new, new numbering begins with the New Testament and new numbering begins again with the index and the concordance. We have a half title page. We have the title page. So it calls itself a numerically coded Greek English and a linear Bible with English Greek index and lexical concordance. Copyright page. Copyright 96 and 2013. Here's the ISBN and the address and also the website. There are numerous videos about the Apostolic Bible by Mr. Vanderpoel here on YouTube. So the introduction um, starts with a description, talks about the Greek scriptures. There's some words here about the translation of the word sin in 2 Corinthians 5.21. We'll take a look at that later. He makes the point that it's translated sin offering here. Uh, again, we'll take a look at that. There's a book, uh, section about the canon. And um, then the Greek text. Now, uh, Greek text doesn't say much here. You really don't get much sense for where the New Testament text is coming from. Uh, it's pretty clear from this section and from the various videos on YouTube that uh, the editor began with the 16th edition of 1587 
So that's uh, Pope Sixtus the Fifth, I think, initiated that, uh, and then it was published after he died. Then he also used the Aldine edition of 1518, which um, is like the Complutensian Polyglot, Polyglot Bible, but closer to the Vaticanus text. 16 is rather close to Vaticanus too. Then he also consulted the Complutensian Polyglot of uh, 1517. He says in a video that where these printed editions differ, he follows the majority, if there is a majority among the three. Where all three differ, he goes with the Hebrew. The New Testament, he says, is based on Hodges and Farstead's majority text. But if you look at the right-hand column of this chart, you'll see places where I found that, in fact, it diverges from Hodges and Forrestad. Um, I checked it in the this ABP in the 153 locations that I've been using for other translations, and as you can see, it is a strongly majority text. A New Testament, it agrees with the Robinson Pierpont Byzantine text form 95.4% uh, of the time. But it does include uh, Acts 837, uh, 9, 5 through 6, 1 John 5, 7 through 8, that's the three witnesses section. It includes through his blood in Colossians 1, 14, and says her cleansing and not their cleansing in Luke 2, 22. All those, I think, are Textus Receptus readings, not majority text readings. Uh, continuing... Um, he talks about the structure of the Bible, the Strong's numbering system that he's modified, and he says, for instance, that if we have a decimal point with the Strong's number, that word appears only in the Greek Old Testament section, headings, chapters, and verses. So I'll let you read this if you like. He talks about his footnotes, and those are abbreviations used in them. He doesn't use the harsh breathing marks in most of the accents. He apparently has decided just to use one accent mark um, on a word. And he does correctly point out that their manuscripts typically don't have accent marks, or very few. Bracket structures, this is useful to know. Uh, so if the Greek reads like this, but the word order in English is more like one, two, three, four, five for a section of text that does that. He will put it in brackets and give you the uh, English words underneath the Greek words and then use numbers to show you the right order in which to read them. Hyphen structures are somewhat similar and but therefore two words, I believe. So he hyphenates here <coughs> uh, right above my thumb. He hyphenates those two Strong's numbers and then the word your in English actually goes with sigma, omicron, upsilon on the right, and breast goes with the word, the Greek word to the left. I'll give some more examples of that. We have a section on punctuation and italics. He talks about uh, daggers for, and not using quotation marks. Collective nouns uh, for people. He uses peoples when it is collective. Proper names, he says, in general, this book has kept a current spellings of well-known names in the Bible. Lord, with a capital L, means the Lord. Proper names have been capitalized. Uh, plants and Animals, a section on that. Then he talks about the English-Greek index, which we saw at the back. You can certainly freeze this and read it if you like. Then the lexical concordance. And uh, these 50 words here, he said, are so common that uh, he has not listed them. Okay. Note on the second edition, which is what we have, and so he's talking about here individual errors, uh, apparently that he's corrected. 
There's something about the analytical lexicon that I mentioned earlier. It, uh, it's not included in the printed edition, but is available at this website on a, on a CD-ROM and in print from the bookstore. Uh, a note on footnotes. And another statement at the end. And then something that I found useful, when I learned Greek, I learned the Erasmian pronunciation, which has the advantage of um, allowing you to spell a word based on the way it's pronounced. Uh, but this is more like what modern Greek, the way modern Greek is pronounced, and I think this is a very useful inset here. We'll do a font comparison in a moment. I want to show you here, though, a close-up look at the font. Maybe a little better like that. So uh, this is the way you would read it in English. It's just the interlinear text here. Uh, if you're interested in reading the Greek, I know people do sometimes deprecate interlinears, but I think they're actually quite useful. The major limitation is that the gloss, the word in English that goes with the Greek word, is uh, very limited. There's only so much space, so you have to choose one of uh, the meanings, and the Greek word may have a very rich meaning. But you can read it in Greek by simply making yourself a card to obscure it. Read the line, and then go on to the next line. And that way you're not constantly relying on the, the crutch of having the English right there next to the word. So it's you, know, you can use it to help yourself learn the language. The, uh, I like the boldness, even though this is quite small. It's small for my old eyes. Um, the English I do find somewhat harder to read because of the background noise there, because it is such a thin font. Try to bring in a page from this. Uh, this is the uh, Brown and Comfort interlinear with the, based on the new Revised Standard Version. So this is a New Testament interlinear. This is a bit tricky because it has uh, the New Revised Standard Version in the outer column. So it's not going to be a straightforward thing to get the Greek text against the Greek text, at least on the same image. But there I think we can see, see how much larger the text is on the right than it is on the left. I actually have less uh, show through on the right as well, and the text isn't quite as cluttered. So from the point of view of reading the interlinear, New Testament by itself, a book like the one on the right, actually I think is more advantageous. Definitely a larger, more readable Greek font there. Now on the right I have the Berry New Testament. This is the George Rooker Berry New Testament. Um, the editor of the ABP apparently used this uh, at some point in the origins of the ABP, um, according to his videos. Uh, the font on the right again is larger, but it's somewhat old and kind of broken. Uh, it does have less show through. But uh, these are New Testaments on the right that I've been showing. This is the only place that I know of where you can get an interlinear Greek-English Old Testament. Now, if you don't have to have an interlinear Greek Old Testament and you're willing to use a side-by-side -side format, uh, the text on the right is Brenton Septuagint. And if you know a bit of Greek, it's really not hard to use at all. You have the English, which you can use as a crutch there, that's fairly close the text, and it's not that difficult to figure out which English words go with which Greek ones. You don't have the uh, Strong's numbers. You do have a nice uh, nice uh, layout here with not a lot of background clutter. Uh, if you are an expert in Greek and don't need the English at all, on the right is Rolf's Septuagint on a cream paper and a very elegant font to the right, very little show through, nicely printed. Now, uh, if you're familiar with the Septuagint, you know that material is arranged differently there. So here in Jeremiah chapter 30, you have this text about uh, Edomia, 
uh, thus saith the Lord, there is no longer wisdom in the man. But it's in chapter 30 of Jeremiah, not in chapter 49, as it appears here. And I believe what he's done is he's rearranged the material based on his printed editions, but also rearranged the material in the Hebrew order. While we were looking at the introduction, we saw a reference to 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 21. There's the Greek text here. And he pointed out that he was uh, translating this Greek word, hamartian, with the words a sin offering. Now it's good here, I think, that he puts offering in italics, because this word typically means sin. Um, my big, biggest criticism here is that um, his translation is of uh, is a sin offering in the second instance, but not in the first. I think if he wanted to do this consistently, I mean, even if you don't know Greek, you can see that this word and this word are identical. So what one should do, I think, is with the English, if it's sin here, then it's sin here, and if it's a sin offering here, then it's a sin offering here. The challenge with these inner, inner linears and also with the reader's edition is to make the uh, to make a graceful choice of the word that you use to translate the Greek word. Here for um the editor has chosen manufacture. I personally, I think that's somewhat clunky. I think um, Comfort has done a better job here. Comfort and Brown with uh, I work for the same word. Um, Bauer gives the primary definition of the word as achieve, accomplish. Um, of course, manufacture falls in this range of the second definition, bring about, produce, or create. But achieve or accomplish seems better to me here. Now, while, we, while we're here, let's just bend down a bit and look at uh, an example of one of these bracket structures. So he, this is the way one would read this. You would come here, I manufacture, I do it, but it is sin living in me. So these brackets clue you that, uh, that you're going to have to read the English words in a different order and the raised numerals here tell you how to do that. That example was from Romans chapter 7. Uh, now I'm just looking at one here in Romans chapter 5, verse 12, where the translation is um, of the Greek FO, which is somewhat controversial, but because is commonly used, um, by which reason I think is, is a good translation as well, but, but because by which reason indicates that uh, something went awry in the editing process here. Another location where the interlinear translation is a bit odd is here in 2 Peter 2.4 where um, of darkness, this word is translated as region, but it's actually an active participle, and it means something like having delivered, ha having sent into Tartarus. And in fact, um, if you look at the analytical lexicon for 5020, that entry, you'll see that in fact, uh, the lexicon is aware of that as well. Tartarao here, 5020, to send down to the infernal regions. So why he chose to translate that with um, a noun region here, when it's actually a verbal form, is not clear. One place where the interlinear is somewhat interpretive here is in Luke chapter 6, verse 1, and it came to pass on Sabbath following the Great One. Uh, this is a word that's not really very well understood, but it's formed from second and first, shoved next to each other. So a literal way to translate this would have been second first, and let the reader try to figure out what that means, perhaps unsuccessfully. Another interesting um, interlinear translation is here in Acts 6.3, where this Greek word, which is normally translated as something like... Uh, look at or inspect, 
is given as number. I'm not sure how that was arrived at. One of the good things about translating the New Testament and the Septuagint together is that one can bring out connections. Um, you can show the New Testament dependence upon the Old. And I like what he's done here with Revelation 1 and 4, where the text has Ha'on, the one being is the way he translates it. I would prefer something like he who is. But by translating it this way and consistently with Exodus 3.14, the connection is pretty clear. So here we have Ha'on and the one being. Now this may take a moment, but we'll go back to Exodus 3.14 and I'll show you what I mean. So here we are at 3.14. And the camera, and you see here, and God said to Moses, I am the one being. Exactly the same as in Revelation. Well, it's time for a summary, and I, I do like a lot of things that are done here. Uh, the, the concept of a Greek English interlinear is, of course, useful. Uh, that or a reader's edition also would, would be useful as well. Um, you've seen my criticisms. I'm not sure I have confidence in the interlinear uh, translation at all points. I think in general it's good, but there are some questionable areas. Um, I would have designed it differently, I think, so that I wouldn't have had to deal with these very wide pages that are hard to flip. On the other hand, it's not uh, as if you're going to be taking this to church and trying to follow a, a sermon from one book to another. Um, the uh, Greek is printed well, although it's small. The English is a little harder on my eyes because it's not quite so bold. Paper doesn't have much sheen to it, which is an advantage. Uh, it is awfully wide, though, and hard to turn. Um, I wish that the uh, Old Testament had uh, been in the normal Septuagint order and not in the uh, Masoretic order, but the uh, editor is following the printed editions that he was using, so it's fair enough, it's a fair choice. And I think that's about all I'd like to say about the Apostolic Bible Polyglot Interlinear English Greek. Thanks very much for watching this video. Uh, remember to like, uh, subscribe to the channel if you haven't done so and are so inclined, and uh, share this with your friends. Thanks for watching.